everyone. Uh, <coughs> my name is Arjun. Uh, excited to be here. Not so excited to be the last talk of the day, but that's how it goes. Uh, this is, uh, this, this is uh, work on model poisoning attacks in federated learning, uh, jointly done with my collaborators at uh, Princeton University and um, IBM Research. So we'll just get into it. Um, uh, what is federated learning? Federated learning is a distributed learning algorithm um, where there's a global server and the global server's aim is to learn a model uh, with high test accuracy uh, and uh, typically in this, uh, uh, one of the methods used for aggregation is weighted averaging, so that's the one we're going to be using. So how, how does this work? Um, well, there's a global server. Uh, it, at any time t, it has a global parameter vector, which and uh, there are a bunch of agents. Now, uh, the global server sends across uh, the global parameter vector to each of these agents at time t. And uh, each of these agents then, uh, uh, each, each of these agents has some locally held data on which it now runs its, uh, uh, it, it runs training and it computes an update to the global model which minimizes the loss on its uh, locally held data and uh, once this is done um, each of these agents sends uh, the update back to, to the global model and uh, or to global uh, so to the to the global server and uh, what the server does is it aggregates all of these updates uh, by adding a uh, by computing a weighted average of them and adding it to the state um, of the global model at the previous time step. And um, this goes on until convergence. And uh, some possible motivations for why you, why, why you would want to work in such a learning setup. Uh, the first is that the agents may wish to keep uh, their data private. Uh, another, another possible reason is that the server wishes to offer computation uh, to, uh, to some agents instead of doing it itself. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the alpha j's are some weighting factors that um, the global server uses. So typically, uh, you can think of them as one over the number of agents in order to ensure that uh, no one agent's update dominates. Uh, you you, you want to act. You basically you just average everybody's updates. Right? They're not learned by the given um, so Something is. Separate. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, you you can also I think <coughs> you could also tune it, but I mean, in in all of the settings that. I, I'm going to consider it's just going to be one over the number of agents. Um, yeah, so uh, what happens if uh, one of these agents is malicious? So uh, so it, it's basically the same setup as before, except now you have one, uh, except one of these agents is now malicious. Now, uh, in uh, th throughout the talk, I'm going to be assuming that there's a single malicious agent and um, that the data is distributed IID um, across agents. So what this means is that malicious agent also has a fraction of the benign data that it can use. Um, so the whole process goes on as before, uh, except uh, the, well, the, the benign agents behave exactly as before, but uh, the malicious agent uh, behaves a bit differently. And so the aim of the malicious agent is to cause targeted misclassification of some auxiliary set of examples that it, it holds um, by the global model. Um, so basically, um, in other words, what it wants to do is it wants to insert a targeted backdoor at the global model. And note that these examples are not going to be modified in any way. It's just the clean examples that are going to be passed to the global model um, on which, uh, and, and these are going to be classified as the particular target specified by the malicious model. Um, yeah, so all of these updates go back and the global server aggregates uh, as usual. So what are some challenges uh, for the adversary in this setting? Um, so the first challenge is that the adversary doesn't have access to the other agent's updates at time t. So uh, uh, our approach to this is very simple. Uh, we just generate a malicious as, uh, update uh, with respect to the previous state of the model in, uh, and uh, just assume that the model doesn't change too much over iterations and it turns out that in practice, well, uh, this works well. Um, the second problem uh, is basically that there's averaging with the other agents at every step. So uh, because so this is a problem because the malicious agent's goal is very different from the other. So in some sense, the other agents constructively interfere with each other, but the the malicious agent is trying to do something different. So it, it's possible that whatever updates it's trying to send and what goal it's trying to achieve could get uh, swamped out by the other agents. So uh, our approach to this is to uh, boost the malicious update to overcome the effect of scaling so that one over the number of agents uh, scaling that Somesh was asking about. So that uh, that's where you have to, uh, that's what you have to overcome here. Um, the third thing is that there could be randomness in the choice of agents. So when there's a very large number of agents, the malicious agent may not be chosen in every iteration. 
For the rest of the talk, I'm going to largely sidestep this issue, uh, and I have some backup slides which uh, show that it still works if you have randomness and choice of agents. But uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this for a bit. And uh, the last thing to do, uh, the, the last thing that the malicious agent wants to do is basically avoid uh, to avoid detection and uh, so some simple ways that uh, some uh, really simple sanity checks that uh, we thought of that the server could use uh, is basically to check the accuracy of the malicious model on validation data or to look at the weight update statistics and detect a particular agent as malicious. So, um, and here the approach is to uh, come up with more sophisticated methods uh, beyond the baseline, uh, which I'll describe uh, by adding some training on benign data and some uh, distance constraints. Okay, so uh, what's the experimental setup for which I'm going to show you results? Uh, we work with uh, Fashion MNIST. Um, the, CN, uh, the CNN is an architecture which achieves 91.5% accuracy, uh, accuracy on test data when all the agents are benign. Uh, there are 10 agents and all of them are called at every time step, including the malicious agent. And um, we stop training when the global model achieves um, across 91% validation accuracy. Um, what's the adversarial objective? It's to classify uh, this image of a sandal, uh, which is class five for uh, fashion MNIST, and we want to get this, this image of a sandal classified as a sneaker. So there's just one, uh, yeah, there's just one target. Um, so, okay, so, so what's our first strategy? So the first strategy is um, the malicious agent minimizes the cross entropy loss between the examples it wants to misclassify, in this case there's only one example, and um, with, a, with respect to the target instead of with respect to the true label. And once it's, uh, once it's found this update uh, to the global model that achieves this, um, it boosts the update by a factor beta, and um, in this case, since there are 10 agents, we just boost by 10, um, and we send it back to, uh, we send it back to the global server. Um, so what happens when you do this? Um, so the first line of interest is the blue line on the screen, so that's the confidence of the global model on the backdoor task. So you can see that it's close to one, which basically means that the global model has, uh, over time the global model basically learns to classify that particular input as uh, a seven instead of a five, which is the true class. Um, the green line shows the accuracy of the global model over time. So this is on the on on the on the test data, which is the standard task. And so the takeaway is basically uh, that yes, this attack works, but the problem is that the accuracy of the malicious model on a test data is really low. So suppose the server decided to just take this update, add it to the state of the global model, and then ch uh, ch uh, you know ch uh, check its accuracy on the validation on test data, and this is really low. So this is one possible way in which you could be detected. So I'm going to talk about how we overcome that. Uh, another interesting thing to look at um, is the weight update distribution. So what you see on the left is um, a histogram of the weight updates. Uh, so the blue, so uh, the the blue curve basically shows um, what the benign weight updates look like, and the red the red shows what a malicious update looks like. So you can see it's really different. So it's for for one, it's much sparser, the um, and then the, the histogram values are much lower. So uh, but the idea that this gave us basically was that um, the the malicious update will somehow be hidden inside a benign one because um, it, as as it's much sparser, and in fact, that's um, I'll, I'll show you uh, I'll show you that you can do that. So, what's the next strategy? So, what, what you need to do is now basically uh, so this red line has to come closer to this green line. So, in order to do that, uh, we have a strategy that we call alternating minimization, where basically the malicious agent first runs the malicious update step, it boosts its update. And um, after that, it runs benign training in order to ensure that classification accuracy on test data um, does not suffer, and it keeps repeating this step until uh, well it achieves convergence. And after uh, and once it's done that, it sends this back to the sends this back to the server. And what happens with this strategy? Well, now you see the blue line is basically unaffected. You're still uh, so the blue line is telling you um, whether the targeted backdoor is being met. So yes, the global model is classifying that five as a seven. But also, now what's nice is that um, the malicious model accuracy on the test data is almost the same as that uh, of the global model, um, which basically means that de detecting it as, um, as an aberrant update is not possible using uh, this method at least. And what happens to the weight update distribution? Well, it's a bit closer to the benign one now. It doesn't look as different, but um, there's still, um, well, the, the range is different and you could, uh, there's, still, there's still some way to go. And uh, yeah, you might, and, you must all be thinking, okay, these are just qualitative uh, uh, 
and and I'm going to show you some quantitative uh, results for the stuff on the right, basically with regard to the weight update. But that's yeah, that's in a few slides. Um, so the last strategy is basically the same alternating minimization strategy, but then we add uh, we add a weight constraint in order to uh, um, and it's like a shaping constraint. And the point is just to ensure that uh, the the update from the malicious agent is as close as possible to an update that you would have sent if it were benign or um, you know, it, or, or if it didn't make an update at all. Um, so now in this case, um, this plot is just basically the same, nothing uh, because this is still in the alternating min, uh, optimization framework. Uh, but uh, when you look at the when you look at the weight update distribution, now um, it's visually much closer and uh, the shape and the range match much more closely. And uh, I'm going to show you some qualitative results for detection using uh, uh, weight update statistics. So, um, so what this plot basically shows you is the spread of L2 distances between all of the benign agents and between malicious agents and the benign agents. So I'm, what we're trying to do here is basically use L2 distances to find outliers. So, um, so the three curves um, in the middle, the light blue one, there's a light, light brown one, light green one. And that's the spread of the L2 distances of the benign agents from each other. And you can see that they're all uh, pretty close to each other and uh, they, they don't stray very far. Uh, but then if you look at uh, if you look at the spread of L2 distances for the malicious agent from the rest of the benign agents, um, it's quite different for the baseline attack. It's also very different for the alternating minimization attack. So basically if there was a detection procedure at the server which used um, L2 distance based outlier detection, of some sort, um, you, would, you, you you might get caught out as an adversary. But then, if you add a distance constraint, uh, now this is now that's this brown line that's running through the center of the plot, and now this overlaps quite a lot with the uh, with the spread uh, shown by the benign agents. So uh, this gives you more plausible deniali deniability as the malicious agent uh, with regards to uh, with regards to where your uh, where your updates lie. Uh, with respect to the other. So the takeaway is adding distance constraints uh, reduces the distinguishability of the malicious update. Finally, um, uh, I just want to show you some some results on interpreting poison models. Uh, not sure whether this could function as another stealth measure, uh, but it, it, it's just interesting to see what happens when you uh, when, when you look at decision interpretation. So uh, this is, uh, we use a suite of interpretability techniques um, and uh, so this is that. So this is the decision visualizations of a global model trained using only benign agents. And uh, yeah, so as you can see, it focuses on the sandal um, largely. You, uh, like the more sophisticated techniques clearly show you, like integrated gradient, show you where it's focusing uh, while making the decision. But then what's interesting is that now that you have a poison model and you're no longer classifying it in the same class, well, the decision visualizations don't seem to change that much. And um, in fact, if you look at the, the if you look at the last two uh, on the right, they well they, they seem almost identical to the human eye. So uh, this maybe provides some other uh, so some additional evidence that interpretability techniques are kind of brittle and they don't really reflect uh, model decisions that well. The the two methods that do like at least to my eyes seem quite different um, are like just using the pure gradients and using the deconf net. So it's possible that using these interpretability interpretability techniques. Uh, this could be some way of uh, detecting malicious subjects. And um, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. I'd like to thank